Hey, I'm Chip Bennett, and I'm here with Suzanne Lewis Johnson, um, and we're going to talk about sex trafficking today. Um, this should be a great conversation, and I hope that it's beneficial to you that uh, will be watching. So, first of all, would you let the viewers know a little bit about yourself? Because you've got a great, great resume, great experience. Because um, somebody who's listening and going, okay, sex trafficking, I want to hear about this, but who's the one telling me this information? Well, it was. A little over 15 years ago now, I think the math is, wow, it's getting to be a while back. But the, I raised my right hand and I swore an oath to become an FBI agent. Okay. And it was an extraordinary privilege. And I got to do that work for 10 years. Before mm. that, I worked for nearly as long with Habitat for Humanity International, which mm. is a faith-based global home builder, building homes with people in need. Uh, as an FBI agent, I primarily investigated human trafficking and crimes against children, mm. although I got to do a little bit of everything. Uh, and then on my 10-year anniversary of my graduation from Quantico, the FBI Academy, I actually walked out the doors of the FBI for the last time as an agent by choice um, because I believed God was calling me mm. to be a voice uh, for the need for truth uh, and for how we really as a community and especially people of faith mm -hmm. can combat the evil that's out there mm -hmm. in the world. I got to see a lot of things behind the scenes and I saw that even with good intentions, mm -hmm. we can so often take the work just a little bit off track, mm -hmm. but just a little bit after a while, you're really far off trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I believe God is truth and that I've been called to be a voice sure. of, of truth and to help equip people mm -hmm. so that together we can be the answer to what's been called modern day slavery, sex trafficking, human mm -hmm. trafficking has been called modern day uh, slavery. And I saw my oath as that it was a commitment to uphold and protect the constitution. That's what it wasn't at its core. I saw that as a commitment to protect freedom. Mm -hmm. And yet I saw that in the land of the free, not everyone was free. And so actually to uphold that oath, I thought that the, the biggest impact I could have at that point after 10 years was to leave the job gotcha. that I loved and to, to go be that voice in that community. What are some things that you would say if you had that moment of somebody watching here that's probably going to watch for just a few minutes yes. and then they're going to go somewhere else or do something else, what would you say is important for them to know about sex trafficking and human trafficking? Right. What you really need to know is it's not the suddenly. Okay. So often it's portrayed in the media. You get the sound bite. Okay. You know, we're a culture of sound bite solutions. Okay. But trafficking doesn't happen generally through the sudden abduction of somebody and suddenly okay. they're forced at gunpoint okay. into this life of trafficking. It's much more subtle than that. Hmm. Evil's weapon, I saw this in the Bureau and I saw it from reading okay. my Bible cover to cover. Evil's weapon is deception. Folks will tell you we're in a war against trafficking. We are not. We're in a war against evil. Okay. And human trafficking, sex trafficking, is that manifestation of that evil hmm. in the physical realm. And so it's subtle. It looks like something good. Uh, traffickers prey on vulnerabilities. So if somebody has a void hmm. in their life, they need relationship, right? We're okay. created for yeah. relationship. And that's so often what we'll see with our kids. I'll say that social media is like an online shopping catalog for predators hmm. because they can go on there and we share, our kids share so many things on social media and we'll say, if they're sad, if they're angry at their parents, if they have a need for money, if they have a need for affection. And that tells the trafficker how to come in and pose as the solution mm. and reel them in. And then the situation degrades over time to often the ugly sorts of things that you'll see in the headlines or in the movies. But generally, it didn't start out that way. And so that's a major misconception. And so we wow. need to understand that. And we also need to understand that there's a degree to which we just cannot control the circumstances. Sure. So we really need to be equipped to inoculate our kids against trafficker tactics. We okay. need to remove those tactics from our culture. And that is the deception. That is the manipulation. We need to teach them what healthy relationships look like so that they recognize 
the counterfeit. We can't keep our kids from the places where traffickers will be because traffickers go, predators go where kids are. So folks will ask me, what's the app? What's the website? What's the physical location? Sometimes Mm. there'll be viral social media stuff about, you know, a trafficker almost abducted my child at this store from the shopping cart or my teenager from the mall. Traffickers are in those places, but traffickers are in all of the places where kids go. It could even be the school lunch table Mm. because they'll use other people. And a trafficker could be a child. It could be another teenager. And so that's the complexity of it. But when we understand it better, we're better, we're better equipped to combat it. And a lot of our approaches have come from a place of fear. Okay. And that too is a trafficker tactic where they try mm-hmm. to instill fear of consequences. And so we don't want to fall prey to that, but we want to have wisdom. And so I'm th- so thankful for this conversation mm-hmm. where we can talk about that. How, how do we make decisions with wisdom? How do we gain that knowledge so we can strike strike that balance and equip okay. our kids. So you're saying that most of the trafficking situations, they happen over time with someone coming in and offering solutions to children that are needs that they have. A need or a felt need. Yes, okay. absolutely. And I would also say you mentioned movement and there's, you know, that word trafficking kind of gives the implication of movement, but movement isn't actually required. So you can have a child who's living at home and being trafficked. You could have somebody who's being trafficked within their home. And we see that Hmm. sometimes where even parents will be the trafficker and people are coming into the home. So we need to also be aware of that. You would say some steps, just some common sense steps that we could do to just open our eyes you know, because I think most of us think of like the Liam Neeson movie Taken. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. you know, and, and that's yes. that. You know, you just the the van comes in the mm-hmm. in the gated community, and your kids out on a bike, and they grab them, and then they're gone to Haiti or wherever. You know, and, right. and drugged up and right. whatever. What are what are things that we can do as parents to open our eyes to the subtlety mm-hmm. of those movements to where we're maybe a little bit more aware, so to speak. Maybe eyes are open. Maybe even if our eyes got open a little bit more, it would help us. What, is there anything, and it it could be one, it could be three, it could be 50. Just just some like common sense things to help us to be aware of this stuff. Well, it's the everyday. It's the little things that we're doing every day as parents and having the conversations with our kids as we go, Hmm. opening the door to dialogue because there may be things that they're encountering. Most kids are online these days. Okay. And so we need to be aware ourselves uh, to the degree that we can be. I mean, the reality is just our kids know more about these devices that they sure. hold in their hands and Absolutely. all the apps and things than we do. Sure. But we know some general principles. Mm-hmm. And that is, this is a place where uh, a predator can contact them at any time, even if it's online gaming, anywhere they're going online. So have the conversations with them about, you really shouldn't be talking to anybody online who you don't know in real okay. life. Okay. That's a great rule of thumb. We also know that probably most of us are connected with people online that we don't know in real life. And if that's the case, then we need to be very careful about moving that relationship from online to having a face-to-face connection. And if that's going to happen, make sure we're putting safeguards in place to do that and have the conversations with our kids about the dangers and the fact that uh, online someone can pretend to be anyone Mm -hmm. they want to be. I heard it said once, it's like Halloween. You can dress up to be anyone you want to be online. And I saw that a lot in my pieces where a teenager thought they were talking to another teenager and they weren't. They were talking to somebody decades older Mm. who was posing as a teenager and trying to form that relationship and then would extort the child on the other end after a period of time Mm. to get explicit explicit pictures and that would decline. And so when that happens, Mm. if that happens, we need to be prepared for that and let our kids know that even if if you um, got pulled into that sort of slippery slope, it's okay. You can come to me and you can talk to me and have that conversation Mm -hmm. uh, because there's then that fear of consequences. Mm -hmm. And if they can't come to you and have that conversation, 
son, they're in even worse sure. danger. And also, as parents, we need to be very intentional about putting community in our kids' lives. Mm. I want to be my child's person. I want to be the first one they come to sure. for everything. But what if they're not? Yeah. And I don't have all of the answers. So who are the other people? I yeah. pray daily for my kids to have community, and not just one, but several in different places where there are eyes, where there is sure. wisdom, and people who can be looking out for them, and to have that for myself sure. as well. That's how we protect against those vulnerabilities being taken advantage of, yeah. is having other people yeah. helping I mean, I have an eight-year-old daughter that can manipulate a tablet and beat me in games, yes. you know, and I, and it's like, she's eight years old. Like, mm -hmm. how, how does that even happen, you know? Yeah. And um, is a large majority of the first step into this world, um, is it coming through social media, coming through the internet, or is it like, well, that's some of it, Chip, but there's also other stuff. I'm just curious as to... Is, is there one large prevalent gateway into that, or is it really, it's, it's multifaceted? It's very much uh, through that sort of media. Okay, is it okay? okay. But every instance is not. Okay. Uh, that definitely facilitates it. You know, I will say to parents sometimes when they, you want to close your kid off sometimes. That's the temptation. Close them off from the world to keep them safe. But sometimes okay. the most dangerous place for your child to be is alone in your house, in their bedroom, with an internet-connected device. So predators will sort of canvas different platforms looking for children who are, I'm upset or I'm or whatever, and, and, and they seize those things and then try to tease out from that a relationship? Absolutely, that's one method that okay. they can use. Another is they just send out all sorts of friend requests, connection requests, and see who bites on that. And then once you are into kind of a group, often there'll be networks of friends and they'll just start friending all of them and mm. they can look like a legitimate person. I know I had a, an investigation, mm. well, I've had several, <laughs> but one in particular that comes to mind where this young lady really thought that she was talking to a real person uh, who had posed as a variety of different people uh, friending folks that she knew so they looked, uh. looked legitimate, but actually none of these people knew this person Okay. in real life and Interesting. was was enticed into doing some things that she never would have done otherwise. I thought she was being a helper. The vulnerability in her instance was her heart, okay, her kindness and her compassion, and then formed what she thought was a real relationship with the person on the other mm. end of the screen. But this was just somebody uh, looking for power and control and manipulation and exploitation. And over time, she ended up sending nude images hmm. of herself. He ends up posting those on the internet, further control. She got in all sorts of trouble, and this actually started because of her compassionate heart where she was trying to help somebody, and she's being told that terrible things will happen to a person if she doesn't then continue sending images. There was no way out for her. Hmm. And I'm hopeful this will look different today. I don't know that it would, but years ago at that time, the adults in her life didn't believe her. Oh. Until I came in from the other side with the FBI where I had already had information behind the scenes because they'd done this to other kids. And we had behind the scenes on those social media accounts and went in and talked to her and were able to tell, thankfully, some of the justice in that case. You know, you get justice in a courtroom, yeah. but I felt like we got some justice for her when we were able to go back and uh, tell the folks that missed it that, uh, no, she was telling the truth. How do you help train children up to be compassionate, which is what we want them to be as Christians, mm -hmm. um, but also to have boundaries? You know, it's like you, you, you see things in your kids that you go, that's great, but here I'm just listening to you saying, okay, those great things of compassion can also lead us into areas where maybe there should have been a boundary. Right. Is there, do you have any wisdom advice on how to like shape that? In I was hoping you'd have some for me, actually. Uh, it is okay. Such, okay, well. Uh, it's such a tough I probably balance. Have some, I probably have some ideas, but. Uh, yeah, you know. no, really. I mean, the, the reality is we're all just people trying to navigate yeah. mm -hmm. through this the best that we can together. And so we need to be having those conversations sure. with our friends, with our spouse. Where are we going to set sure. those boundaries with our kids? And who else is going to be in our lives who can be 
a resource and say, oh, hold up. We need to think about this. I mean, one of my girls years ago, we'd had the conversations about stranger danger. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I find her talking to a stranger in the front yard with a puppy dog. And I said, honey, what are you doing? Well, it was a nice stranger, mama. Yeah. So we can talk in theory. The reality is it's hard to teach those things. I agree. In real life. And we all, we want to be kind. Uh, You know, I've had the conversation with lots of folks with our kids about, yes, I want you to be kind. You can also use me as the out. That's right. Of I'm not allowed. Yeah. I'm not allowed. Or let me go check. Let me go check. Or I want to help you. I'm not sure that I can. Or I can't do that right now. What are those phrases that we can have ready if we start to get pulled into something? Because that's truth. Yes, I want to be there for you. I want to help you, but we also don't want to enable that's other right. people to that's make right. poor choices by helping too much. That's not love. Yeah, that's not. Love. So exploitation is really, at the end of the day, it's one of the key things that's going on here. Is somebody's exploiting, yes. Yes. maybe even a good characteristics of a of a kid, yes. um, or someone, mm-hmm. even an adult, exploiting some of that and then taking it and twisting it and and, and using it against them. Correct. And and that compassion. Um, want to do the right thing can end up being, well, if you don't keep sending these pictures, I'm going to do something bad yeah. to your friend. And it, that, that churns on the inside of that person who's right. got a real strong sense of doing what's right and not hurting someone. Yes. It gets it gets manipulated. Yeah, because understanding that, that, you know, having that boundary of going, oh, well, no, I'm, I'm not doing that under any circumstance. You know, that, that that's it's it's difficult to get your kids to, to see that because you're right. You know, it's, it's a, that's a nice stranger, Mommy. What are some things that you would like to see churches do um, or implement or have a part of their fabric mm-hmm. of their core DNA um, that would help? Not Because I'm, I'm, I, I got to believe that some of this happens at churches. Yes. And I got to believe that churches are probably a great place for predators to come in because Christians tend to be harmless as doves. We just don't tend to be wise as serpents a lot of times. We're told mm-hmm. to be both. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what would you say to a pastor or somebody in ministry what are some things they should have in place um, or things they should be thinking about globally on this particular issue? Yeah. Well, we need to have a, the conversations and bring in the training. Okay. I love to do that. I love okay. to have the conversations. I love to equip the staff. And so I'm certainly happy to do that. So, so, wait, also... so not, not to interrupt you, but are you okay? C- c- can, we, can we attach your name and a, a, a way to contact you if somebody's watching this and wants some training? Yes. Okay, good. You can do that. Uh, so contact me directly, um, probably Uncaged Canaries. I'm also uh, at the helm of a nonprofit called No More Trafficking. And okay. we have some resources okay. on that website with some group studies that folks can do in churches, in schools, in the workplace. It's about combating trafficker tactics. Okay. So we could have an hour about each one of those segments a conversation about that but it's about equipping folks to understand what are the traffic or tactics and now let's have some conversations together Mm. about where we might see those and how we can put those safeguards in place in that community in Mm. place to hold us accountable um, to help keep us and our kids and our community safe you probably can't give an exact percentage and and i realize it's Mm going to be just something you pull out of the air but with your experience and what you've seen what percentages of the churches in America are oh. really are really um, robustly um, suited in this particular issue? I don't know that any of us are robustly suited. Okay. I mean, that's why I left where okay. I was, sure. just to have the conversation. And not that I have all of the answers, but I've just had a really unique opportunity mm-hmm. to have perspective. And we're going to get there together. It's not me alone or any one sure. organization or church alone is it's all of us having conversations and understanding the root issues human trafficking and we can get overly focused on trafficking so focused that we actually miss it because it's a lot of things coming together often there's root issues like there's the tactics that traffickers use and then there's what are the consequences of that there's poverty there's the uh, housing issue homelessness you know when Mm -hmm. i worked with habitat for humanity what I've come to discover over time is we were addressing human trafficking. We were addressing a vulnerability, the need for simple, decent, affordable, safe housing and giving people life skills. I had a conversation earlier today 
with somebody about a mentoring organization that they had worked with. Those mentoring groups, if you're a mentor, if you have mentors in your life, that is such a safeguard okay. against trafficking. There's evidence that shows that makes a tremendous difference, both in mm. protecting from trafficking okay. and in pulling folks out of that. Because if you have unhealthy relationship, you combat that with healthy mm. relationship. Okay. Traffickers often have networks uh, mm. to take folks into captivity, whether the trafficker sees it like that or not. Uh, they might not use those particular terms, but we need networks okay. to do to do the opposite. And you know, lots of communities have that to some degree, but we can all do better. And that's where the church has such an important role because we are a community. And by living on mission and being who we are called to be, that's what's gonna stop sure. trafficking. It's not necessarily starting a nonprofit or doing all the other things, starting another ministry. It's it's just being connected. The pieces are there. We just need to bring them together. Yeah. But fair fair to say probably a lot of churches could use some training on this. Um, I, I just suspect that this yes. is one of those things where um, you, you didn't know you needed to know it Correct. until it happens in Correct. your midst. And then you have that aha moment that yes. you go, wow, I should have had that aha moment before this happened. You yeah. know? Um, and, and, you know and, and like you said, I mean, you could still have all the defenses and everything going on and still something could happen. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, um, as a pastor, as a church, we're supposed to shepherd and, and care for the people. And one of the ways in which we do that is to try to make sure that we don't have, you mm -hmm. know, like, you know, we, you know, we do background checks. We do yes. all those things. I mean, yes. you're a total advocate for all of those things, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Because yeah. you'll have people sometimes go, well, yeah, I don't have yeah. to about you. And, you know, it's no. like, no, you, you can't, you just can't serve in this ministry if you don't have that. And it's Correct. not that we don't love you. It's not that we're trying to Correct. judge you. It's not that we're trying, but we are there to protect these kids. Yes, and I'm asking you to set an example by yeah. being willing to do this so that the person that you're not concerned about who is a concern yeah. isn't going to balk about it, that they're going to go ahead with yeah, the process had, too because everybody does it. We've had some issues where uh, uh, maybe a greeter mm. says, well, I, I, I shouldn't have to do background check. But that greeter can sometimes get pulled if, Into other if roles, right? something's going on where they're back mm -hmm. in the children's area now. And now all of a sudden, yes. they're, and they've not been background checked, and now we could be pulling somebody in. Um, are they, they solve all the problems, no, but, they're, but, right. th but there should be certain policies in place in a church that help somewhat mitigate some of these things. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Like you said, they're not going to catch everything. And we need to know, too, it is happening in our midst. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. We as individuals with our processes and policies aren't going to stop all of the things, mm. but it can help to stop it and the education can help just to recognize. And I do believe that together we can we can bring it to an end. So if you right now, every person in ministry in the United States and every pastor in the United States stopped what they were doing and they were listening in right now, um, what would you say? I have so much to say to them because one, I do want them to know that there is hope and what you are doing already mm. matters. If you are building the kingdom, living the Jesus way, mm. when we all do that, that is how we will end trafficking. That's how we'll mm. end exploitation because that's what Jesus came to do was set people free. That is the story of all of history. On a very practical level, we need to understand trafficking because sometimes we do harm by um, latching on to, to different things that mm. look good, but are they good? Because the enemy's weapon is deception, not just sure. the, the trafficker, but that can we can even mean to do well yeah. and end up doing harm if we don't have the information mm. and the wisdom. So please, please get educated so mm. you don't even inadvertently end up doing harm. And then third, I think one of the major challenges that we often have in this arena is we see people as as evil the good person and the evil person mm. and honestly i've sent people to prison who i believe actually love jesus but do you know that we're all broken people mm -hmm. and we're all on this sanctification journey and so because somebody loves jesus doesn't mean they won't do terrible things sure and you know that's something the world really struggles with mm -hmm. Or we judge and say, well, they can't be a Christian because they did this. Mm -hmm. uh, but and they may not be acting as a Christian, but are, are doing biblical things, but it doesn't mean that they're not. I mean, the, the church at Corinth is a great example. They were yeah. doing all kinds of bad things that were terrible, but Paul addressed them as saints. You know, yeah. so uh, um, 
what place is there? It seems like there should be a place where um, the parents are brought together and, and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and maybe with or without the kids, but um, where this is at least talked about some. I can't say that it's like something we've mm-hmm. done regularly or at all, at all. I mean, I know we're doing stuff now with having you down, um, but d- does that does that resonate with you? That yes, there should I mean be- that's what we're working to do is build those those resources so that we can hand those to churches yeah. and really equip you to have the conversations with good information that's presented in a way um, that folks can digest and then apply. That, I think, coupled with the processes where you do the background checks, mm-hmm. where even the way you're doing ministry, not even because we don't trust you, but if you're serving in the nursery, maybe you shouldn't be serving alone. Or if you're driving kids somewhere, maybe there should be two adults for your own protection yeah. and for the kids' yeah. protection, because it's always better to have two people yeah. and have that perspective. And, and and not every church feels like they're in a place where they can do that because they're short on yeah. on people. But I would really, really recommend there are some things to take some some resources and intentionality, but those things can make a world of difference. Are there any things that you feel like that the average church sort of does that actually does more enabling than defensive? The first thing that comes to mind is I have seen a lot of churches latch onto cultural narratives. Hmm. And well, we wouldn't do that at all. Whatever <laughs> is, you know, it's in the news. How do you know that what you see is true? It might be mostly true. It might tug at your heartstrings, but be careful what you latch on to and ask, how do I really know that that is true? Uh, we live in a culture where things go viral on social media yeah. and we accept it as true, or it's reported so many times in the news that we accept it as true but have we gone back to the original source how do i know that's really Mm. true uh no matter what it is and we'll see the pendulum swim Mm. swing in our culture where we all get on the bandwagon and go a certain direction and then over time we realize we went too far Mm -hmm. and we come back the other way and and so as churches we need to be really intentional about understanding why we're doing what we're doing. If mm-hmm. we're latching on to a particular cause, um, human trafficking is the coming together of a lot of things. So how we address different issues mm-hmm. that come to us is going to affect trafficking. All the things in the headlines are gonna affect trafficking. And sometimes there are consequences that are unintentional consequences where we didn't anticipate, where we do harm. And so really understanding and bringing perspective and taking our time and knowing where we're called and going there, but doing it based on good information. God is truth and God is love. And so we need to bring those those things together. It's not making decisions solely based on uh, affection and it's not just hitting people with facts. Mm. It's a coupling of the two of those. And we really need to do it in everything when we're talking about uh, addressing trafficking, anything can impact. Hmm. Uh, so if we want to bring folks to a place of freedom, you know, it starts with God's people. It always starts with hmm. us. It starts with us humbling ourselves, truly. Humble humble yourselves and pray. And that's where I hope I'm starting out every day. And that's where I'm hoping that those who want to take action in this arena We'll start start from that place of humility and learn because if we run ahead too fast without gathering the facts, that can be dangerous too. Church people can grab a hold of something and run with it about as good as anybody can, and 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 I, I think that one of the things that I, I've seen and part of it's my education and and other stuff is that um, we're, we're we should be people of truth. We should be people mm-hmm. that love the truth, mm-hmm. um, but oftentimes we love the narrative, or we love the echo chamber rather than we love the truth. And um, I think it's a lost art, especially in a large segment of American Christianity, to really take the time Mm -hmm. and dig through. It's just easier to say, I don't know, than than it is to just jump on the bandwagon. Just Mm -hmm. say you don't know. Um, But if you're you're going to promulgate something or you're Mm -hmm. going to fight for something, um, you, you better make sure that you've done a very good job of looking through 
and, and, and that's, that is a process. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I often joke with my dad. Um, we, we talk every day and, uh, we typically go back and forth on certain issues that we may agree or disagree on. And one of the things that I tell my dad, I'm like, well, dad, hold on for a second. Your, your research is you, you did watch TV and you did do some stuff online, but you only listened mm -hmm. to one side of an yes. issue. So when I did my PhD dissertation defense, um, I could have had 800 yes. books in yes. my bibliography and they would have said, we're not, we're not taking your dissertation because every one of those 800 books are the same opinion. We want to see synthesis. We want to yes. see that you're able to take all the differing views and put something together and give us something. And I said, I think that's missing, Dad, in some of your stuff is that you're 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 taking this this one side and you feel like you've done all this data and research but you really have done nothing you've lived in an echo chamber mm -hmm. um and and so i think that you know when it comes to these issues um what you're saying is is we really need to do our 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 study we, we do i mean there's one truth truth yeah. doesn't have two sides yeah so people often ask for the Oh, the, well, well, they say three. They say there's three sides. Side. You know, yours, are mine, and the truth. But the truth only has one yeah, side. Yeah, we know it from orbiting the situation. How much perspective mm -hmm. can we bring in? You know, you talk about the 800 books. Well, those 800 books, they all come from one source. Yeah. Even do we have firsthand sources? Sure, that's right. How do we know? That's we can't know all of the things, but we can know to some degree. And so that's really the way we need to chart our course forward and seeking to understand. Sure. Seek to understand. Just listen. Listen yeah. to the people in front of yeah. you. I, I, I often say that I wish people, especially in the church, but just people in America in general, would spend time with people who do not see the world the way they see it and mm -hmm. listen to them. Because mm -hmm. you, you, you would expand yes. a little bit on things. if you, there, we, we just tend to surround yeah. ourselves with our own people. Give me a perspective as someone who um, truly knows very little about all of this. How, how prevalent is trafficking mm -hmm. in our country? Like, like, like... Is it, would you say, hey, it's going on in every city in America? Absolutely. In every, okay, so it, it is it is pervasive. Absolutely. It is everywhere. You know, I go back to the beginning of time and mm -hmm. the snake that slithered up to a woman mm -hmm. and took the truth a little off track and humanity fell into captivity. It is truly, I believe, God's story. You know, if, if you read the Bible from cover to cover, um, you see how the word prostitute, appears mm. over and over and over. There are all these prostituted women, though, in Scripture who um, God used to change the trajectory of all of history. Mm -hmm. The only time, do you know, that God uses that term, that it's used in Scripture in a derogatory way, is when God's talking about his own people. His own people, yeah. Uh, but you see that language throughout Scripture, and so folks will say, well, when did this start? And I'll say, the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. and, and it is truly everywhere. And when I worked as an FBI agent, I had investigations that touched on small places, touched on large places. Mm -hmm. I put out intelligence reports that talked about how traffickers actually would target small communities. They would come into small mm -hmm. communities because they believed that folks were not educated and on guard there in the way that they were in, in larger cities. And so it's everywhere. It might look a little different, but the tactics are always the same. And that's why I bring it back to those trafficker tactics and having healthy relationships, having community and addressing the root issues because evil's tactics don't change over time. The mechanisms might look a little different. You know, now we have social media and the internet and it's allowed it to proliferate, but mm -hmm. it doesn't change over time. To someone who's listening in and uh, is not a believer, they're just not a believer. Mm -hmm. um, what would you What would you say to them? Because they, they 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 may go, well, it's great that you talk about evil. It's great yeah. that you talk about this. Yes. It's great that you say all that stuff. You're, you're not talking my language at all. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, what, there, is there anything you would say to them? Um, I mean, obviously, we're Christians. We're going to come from yeah. a particular viewpoint. But is there anything of that you would say to them um, who, who might find themselves maybe not on the believing side? Um, here are some things at least to consider. Um, for those who are not on the believing side, first of all, I'd say I'm sorry because I'm not sure why you're in that place. But some really ugly things have been done in the name of 
faith and sometimes uh, believers, people who really want to love Jesus and call themselves Christians, um, you know, using those trafficker tactics. Mm. And I believe as a believer that that is the deception of the enemy. And so you see a lot of spiritual abuse Mm. and uh, you see even folks using intentionally or accidentally the threat of hell and eternal damnation Mm. to try to, or inadvertently coercing people into certain behaviors. And I think that's turned a lot of people off Hmm. from understanding who a loving God is. And there is a God who loves you. And for me, I am motivated to be a vessel for that Hmm. God. And that's why I do what I do when I left where I was. So I would say to them, I'm sorry. And um, I give thanks for, for grace in the times where Maybe I've been over in that in that mm. camp, you know, believing that maybe um, we were being vessels of love in times that that we weren't, mm. and uh, what we all need to know uh, is that evil's weapon truly is deception. There is truth. Mm-hmm. We've been having a lot of conversations in all of the spaces about truth and what is true and what is evil. Uh, There was a time where we weren't doing that. And I think the world has descended into a place in recent years where uh, whether we're people of faith or not, we talk about this concept Mm. called evil. And trafficking truly is the coming together of a lot of evils. I saw that in the Bureau. And I do believe that we could combat that with truth Hmm. and compassion. So whether you read the same book that I read, uh, I know from my life experience that compassion, love, truth, those are the answers. It's the way we treat each other. It's being decent to our neighbors and watching out for our neighbors. And there are a lot of people in my life who won't set foot inside of a church Hmm. because of the things that they have seen people do in the name of Jesus. And so actually when I speak, a lot of times I speak in uh, places that aren't faith forums. And so I don't speak the way that I'm speaking today. And and that's the world where I spent a lot of my time was within the government and uh, I'm comfortable having those conversations in those places. And I find that people who who wouldn't uh, profess themselves as believers care about the same things I care about. Mm-hmm. They care about their neighbors. They care about their children. Yeah. They want to live love and speak truth too. And we've become so divided as a society, but this is an issue that we all care about. Yeah. And we can come together regardless of what words we're using, mm-hmm. that we can come together and be the solution sure. together. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm not speaking just to the church. Yeah. Uh, I'm speaking uh, to all of our neighbors. And uh, I believe there's so much power in the corporate world, the way we do business, Mm -hmm. the way we model treating people there, the way we model treating people in the government, in social services. I'm so grateful for servants in education and Mm. social services who are doing a ton of good, where sometimes the church tries to set up uh, alternate systems. Yeah. We don't need to do that. We need to support those in law enforcement. Yeah. We need to support those yeah. in social services Leverage. and all those places. And maybe we need to go work there. That's yeah. what I did. You know, even though I left, um, I miss it very much. And I'm so thankful for for the folks working in that arena. We need more of them, truly. You said an interesting thing. Um, it didn't, it may have, people listening may have missed it, um, but uh, but it stuck out to me. You said Christians using some of the same tactics as traffickers. Yes. Okay. Speak into that for a minute because that's this is a because it's true. I mean, mm. manipulation, yes. um, fear, uh, control, power over, um, all of those things can be done in the name of God yes. and can be done in trafficking. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, if you look at some of our social issues, we have decided, I think some of us, this is the outcome that we want. And for the sake of the outcome, we don't really look at the way we're doing things. And so we've succumbed to trafficker tactics. 
traffickers use deception. So if we're spinning the narrative to reach a positive outcome, we're not living the Jesus way. Hmm. Jesus taught us the way to live. If we really trusted that our God is who we say he is, then if we live the way we were taught to live, we can trust him for that outcome. Amen. I couldn't agree more. You know, the uh, the Greek word for truth hmm. is aletheia. And um, you're probably familiar with the English language when you put a a before a word like atypical, it means mm -hmm. not typical. Mm -hmm. It's an alpha primitive. Mm -hmm. um, Alatheia, um, lethe is the mythical um, river of forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. So the a before lethe means it's that which cannot be forgotten. Mm -hmm. That's truth. Mm -hmm. um, and and so when we talk about speaking truth, you know, um, it, it's it's just more than just a factual yes. data. It's something that will never stop to be. It, it mm -hmm. will always be remembered because it's true, yes. you know. Um, and that's a that's a chore, though. How do how do you speak truth in love? Mm -hmm. um, most people either want to speak love with no truth, or they want to yes. speak truth with hardly any love. And it's yes. that polarization. But uh, um, you know, speaking to these issues is can be a challenge. Well, listen, I I can't thank you enough for your time. Mm -hmm. Please avail yourself if you're in ministry or a pastor. Um, please go and get this information. Um, I, it will be beneficial to you, to your people, um, and ultimately to those in your uh, neighborhoods. But uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank really appreciate you. It. Okay,